right, good morning, everyone. Would you stand and worship with us? Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. You are faithful. Shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord Most High. Where you send us, God, we will go. You're the answer, want the world to know. We will trust. Father God, we do lift our praises to you, Jesus. Lord, we pray that um, they are pleasing to you, Lord. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Father, I thank you for each person who's here today. And Lord, I pray that you will open up our hearts and minds to be receptive to what you have for us to hear today, whether it's through the worship, whether it's through the word. Just help us to lay down our burdens and to focus solely on you, Jesus. 
We give you all glory and all honor and all praise. Amen. Jesus, you endured my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame, all because of your love, all because of your love. Maker of the universe, broken for the sins of the earth, all because of your love, all because of your love. Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love. of your love, all because of your love. Lord, you gave your life for me. I will give my life to you, all because of your love, all because of your love. Because of your cross, my because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love, because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love. Your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love, because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life
Standing face to face In a moment we will be like Him He will wipe our eyes dry Take us up to His side And forever we will be His Singing blessing and honor and glory And power forever to our God Singing blessing and honor There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are welcome come close
experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory. mercy that are new every day and we thank you for this time together and we pray that you would uh, just help us to sharpen each other in this fellowship while we're here and we would just draw strength from being in your presence we pray that our worship was a, a blessing to you father and that it glorified you and nothing else and just lift it up to you as an offering and, and just pray that it's pleasing father and we pray that uh, you would uh, just speak to us this morning we pray you Bless the pastor, bless his efforts of preparation, and bless us through the words that he brings. We pray your hand be on him as he delivers the message. We pray you continue to help us be a light in the community that we're in, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Meet and greet. Shake a hand. Say howdy to somebody. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Three Crosses. Uh, this morning, Pastor Dane is going to be teaching from Matthew 16, 1 through 20. And he's titled his sermon, uh, Who Do You Say I Am? And then on Wednesday, he's going to continue in Genesis. And then, uh, and then you can stick around for corporate prayer right after. And if you have uh, cell phones or devices, go ahead and put it on silent. Or if uh, you're not going to use them, just to go ahead and just turn them off. And then uh, the women's Bible study is going to be meeting tomorrow from 6.30 p.m. to 8. And then the men's Bible study meets on Saturday, February 17th from 8 a.m. to 9.30. And then there's going to be a night of worship on February 21st at 7. Uh, there's going to be uh, some sandwiches. So go and bring your favorite dish or dessert so, uh, to go along with those sandwiches. And, uh, and then come prepared for some awesome music. And then this will be the last announcement we do for the 2017 tax receipts. So if you haven't signed up to, uh, to receive them from, uh, just sign up in the foyer and uh, Rick will be able to take care of you. And then the Girl Talk is having a, their next Bible study on February 18th. Um, so if you have any questions on that, contact Hannah or Lindy and they'll uh, get you straight on directions. And also if, uh, if you can't get a hold of them, just to contact the front office and they'll be able to help you as well. And then... Uh, there's an opportunity for men and women of Calvary Chapel to, uh, to join them uh, on March 31st for the Caldito Soup Kitchen. They're going to be uh, uh, volunteering there from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. So there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer, so please sign up there. And if you have any questions, contact Melissa 
or uh, Diaz or Hannah Mireles uh, for more information on that. And if we have any first time visitors, uh, please see one of our greeters. They'll be uh, happy to take care of you. They'll give you a welcome packet. And then I have joke of the week. I was suggesting not to say it, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyways. I was, I'm waiting to see, like, uh, he told me, you know, he might replace me with Fred, so. I, I think so. <laughs> but we're going to do it anyways. A country farmer had hired, had a hired hand who was in love with the neighbor's daughter. And you got to remember, Valentine's is coming up, so this is kind of, it's not going to end good. <laughs> so every, every day after his work was done, the hand would borrow the farmer's lantern and walk over to a neighbor's house to court his beautiful daughter. And every night, the farmer and his wife would sit on the porch and watch the young man, uh, watch the young man in his quest, remembering their own courtyard, uh, courting days. One day, while they were working in the field, the farmer brought up the subject of the man's courtship. The farmer expressed his approval of the relationship, but stated his dis displeasure for one thing. He goes, "You keep taking a lantern over when you go. That's what." Uh, that's wasting valuable oil, son. Why, when I was courting my wife, I didn't use a lantern at all. Really? The hired hand replied. He goes, yes. And you see what I, you, and you see what I got stuck with? <laughs> Welcome, Pastor Dean. That's, that's a boo. Told you. So, so that's an example of what not to do on Valentine's Day. His wife was back at the first service, and she was like, even, even you, Marco, that's over the top. So it's all Marco because I said, I don't think it's a good idea. He's like, no, it's good. So please, please talk to him afterwards. Pray for him at least. So let's stand as we go over this month's uh, memory Bible verse. And we're going to try to say it. I broke it down just the way it is and uh, pause a little bit after each sentence so we can try to say it together. You guys ready? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up, according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Ephesians 4.29. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. I pray, Lord, again, just prepare our hearts and mind to, to receive your message as we know we've come here to meet with you, to experience you, to, to be directed and guided, to be even, um, um, just even point in the right direction, Lord. And give us encouragement as we study your word this morning. And then as we leave here, Lord, help us with the ability to apply what you teach us. Again, bless everyone that's here. Continue to grow them and change them to be more like your son. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. If you guys want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 20. And I've entitled this, who do you say I am? And we're going to see it's like the most important question that can be asked and answered. But I want to begin with as, as um, we can look at life. Life is full of questions, isn't it? Many times we don't always have the, the answers. Sometimes questions are really difficult to answer. Some are rhetorical in nature. And some are just kind of funny. So I'm going to lean on the just kind of funny ones this morning. I ran across these questions as I was preparing for this message. So, again, nothing like Marco's, okay? Just so you know, it's, it's, it's wholesome, good, won't get me in trouble questions. We begin with the question that I ran across is, why is the word abbreviation so long? You guys ever think about that? Is that an is interesting question? Is there another word for synonym? I have a hard enough time saying that. And here's the one I like. How come you've never read the headline said, Psychic Wins Lottery, right? If they're really that psychic, you think, what well, I'll be hitting the lottery. And now here's one that you all can relate to. Why do we press harder on the remote control when we know the battery is dead? Have you guys ever done that? You're just pushing harder? You know it's dead because I don't want to get up and go get a new battery. Very last one, and I think this is appropriate. If a cow laughed... Would milk come out of her nose? That's something to take and ponder as you leave, right? Now, these questions may seem silly, funny, uh, a little questions, but the question we're going to look at today is what we call the big question. 
the most important question of all. It is a question whose answer will determine the factor of whether we're going to go to heaven or hell, where we're going to spend eternity. So Jesus will be asking this question. He begins by talking to his disciples, which in essence, he's talking to us. He says, who do you say I am? We're also going to see how Jesus, as he's teaching the disciples, he brings up different questions to bring them, to draw them, to focus on this very question because he knows it's important. What's really interesting also is that guess who gets it right? The guy that, who never gets it right in the disciples? Peter. He's always saying the wrong thing. Today, Peter gets the answer right. And you know why he gets it right? Because God gives him the answer. God's like, you need some help, Peter. Here's the answer. But not just because of that, but when we hear his answer, it's going to speak directly to our hearts to answer the question, who do you say I am? So let's begin. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. Matthew 16, verse 1 through 4. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the sign of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it, except for the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. Now, in the context of what has just happened, after feeding 4,000 people, Jesus and his disciples, they depart from that area in the boat, um, and they go to the western shore of, of the Sea of Galilee, up to a region of Magdalen. What we're going to see is like they get in the boat, they teach someone, they cross over to the other side, they're going back and forth, hitting these different places. Upon arriving shortly after, the Pharisees and Sadducees begin to test Jesus. They come and they begin to testing it, challenging him. They don't ask for a sign. They demand a sign from Jesus. Now, this kind of blows my mind. If we look back at the two previous chapters earlier, Jesus fed the 5,000 uh, 5, men and women with a few loaves and fishes. And then we see the sequel of loaves and fishes too, where he feeds the 4,000. And both times, these Pharisees and Sadducees are present. They see the signs that they're asking for now before their very eyes it's happened. But yet they refuse to, they choose not to believe. And Paul addresses this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. He says, in, in this section, Paul writes that Satan has blinded the minds of those who have willingly rejected the gospel. These Sadducees and Pharisees have willingly rejected the gospel. Because again, think about these guys. They're the religious leaders. They're the ones that have studied the Torah, the Old Testament, the words of God. And they, of all people, should know when God's standing before them. When the very Messiah they're telling people is coming, they should recognize him, right? And But they cho they've chosen to reject it. But there's also, on the other side of the coin, if a person desires to see the light, and if a person desires to know the truth, if you're here today and you're seeking to know the truth, guess what? God will reveal that truth to you. Regardless of your situation or your surroundings. How does Jesus respond? As again, the Pharisees, can you see someone in high power? We look at the religious people today and some are really high up there and even like you think of a, a politician, you, you feel like they have this power over you and you feel humbled in their presence. That's kind of what these religious leaders are. So how does Jesus respond to them? Well, he responds in this way. He says, you're able to look at the sky and determine the weather. You determine what it's going to be like. Either it's cloudy, and if it's not cloudy, it's going to be sunny. It's going to be, it's going to be a nice day. Or if it's cloudy, it's going to be rainy. But yet, the signs of the times are before your very eyes, and you don't see what's about to unfold. Do you guys know what sign is before their very eyes? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, which means he's here for a reason. And when Jesus came upon the earth, things begin to unfold to lead to our salvation and forgiveness. But yet, these guys, of all people, should have known. But they did not because they chose to reject the gospel. And one thing I've noticed about the gospel message, you may tell someone, it's like, I remember Chuck Smith saying this, I've told it to you as simply as I would tell it to a baby. So in other words, it's easy to understand. And you get frustrated because people don't accept it. Maybe they believe it, but they choose not to accept it because it doesn't fit with their life. Right now, I want to enjoy myself. 
before I accept Christ. I know it's true. But see, the problem with that is, how many of us here know if we're going to have another breath? How about another day, another month, another year? We don't know how long we're going to be here. So that sounds kind of foolish, doesn't it? Because if you die in your sins, you're going to stand before God and you're going to be judged for those sins. The coming of the Messiah, again, has been written and spoken of, foretold in the Scriptures, which, again, these guys are supposed to be the experts on. These are the experts of the Scripture. Yet again, the Messiah stands before them and they don't recognize Him. They challenge Him. If they knew this, that He was the Messiah, which as we're going to see in a few minutes, Jesus is God. They're challenging God. Do you, do you guys see that as a losing proposition there? You're challenging God. Who do you think is going to be, have the more wisdom, you or them? But foolishly, they continue to challenge and try to test Jesus. Now, we look back in the Old Testament, Daniel prophesied precisely when the Messiah would come. In Daniel chapter 9, if you want to go back and look at that, he tells us when he would come on the scene. So again, they should have known that the Messiah was there in their presence. Now, to answer their desire for a sign, he says, I'm I'm not going to give you a sign. I'm going to give you one sign, a promise sign. This sign will have power to bring people to faith. And you know what that sign is? He's talking about the sign will come, his resurrection from the dead. And he refers to the sign of Jonah because it the sign of Jonah, the story of Jonah has many uh, purposes to it, to teach us lessons, but also it is a picture of Jesus Christ. Jonah was, is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, that's quite a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? Can you imagine being in, I can't even stand the smell of fish, but for three days and three nights, he's in the, uh, the belly of a well, just as Jesus would soon. Remember, he's talking to the Pharisees, Soon you will see this sign, I will be in the tomb for three days and three nights, and then I will be resurrected from the dead. So he's saying, here is the sign that you will need. He's even giving them a heads up, it's coming. He's telling them directly, expect this sign to happen. But the, the other issue we have, it, it's not going to matter. As, as you guys know of scriptures, it didn't matter. They still did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, even after he resurrected. Most of them didn't. But they have already seen many miraculous signs, and here's the thing. Are they really asking for another sign? No, they're just trying to trip Jesus up. They've already chosen to ignore and chosen to disbelieve everything that Jesus has done. The healing of the sick, the feeding of the thousands, the many miracles that Jesus has done, the Pharisees have been there. And if they personally haven't been there, they've had other people from their leadership or, that are spies that have been there. But their goal is they didn't like what Jesus was doing. Do you guys know what Jesus was doing that they didn't like? Jesus was drawing people away from them to himself. And that's the thing we've got to understand as Christians, as believers, as teachers, as leaders. Our goal is not to draw people to us, not to draw people to our church. Our purpose is to draw people to God, to draw people to Jesus Christ where they find forgiveness. Let's continue on and see what happens next in Matthew 16, verse 5. So when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They they discussed this among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. So after leaving the Pharisees, they once again, Jesus and his disciples, they cross over the, the Sea of Galilee. Now remember where Jesus had just come from. He just came from dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? So it's fresh on the mind of the disciples. So he's going to use this interaction that he had with these religious leaders to teach his disciples a spiritual truth. So Jesus begins with this, be careful, be on your guard. And the disciples missed the point. And you know why they missed the point that Jesus is making? They, like many of us, focus on what we can see. We focus on this physical realm And therefore, many times we miss the spiritual lesson. So many times the Pharisees, Jesus would say something and they would misinterpret it in a physical way when he was speaking spiritually. So when Jesus mentions the yeast, guess what? The disciples thought go immediately to the bread. Because he said yeast. You know, you use the yeast to make the bread rise. Well, basically, they felt guilty because someone, it doesn't tell us, it's interesting, it doesn't tell us which one of these guys forgot to bring the bread. So we'll see, Jesus is going to see them. They're going to discuss, I like the word they use, 
Well, let's go ahead and look at it in verse 8. We're going to see the disciples discussing, which I would say is probably arguing. He says, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or seven loaves for the 4,000, and how many baskets full you gathered? So while they're discussing, arguing, they said, hey, you were the one who was supposed to get it. Can you see them guys? Like, yeah, I told you to get it. No, you're supposed to get it. But now Jesus is getting on our case because we forgot the bread, and guess what? He's hungry. So Jesus, knowing what they're doing, you know he knows his disciples very well. Again, he chose them. And sometimes you think, where's the wisdom in that? But the wisdom is we can see, we can relate to them. Many of us are Peters. Many of us are uh, James and John. You know, you call down thunder. Let's kill these people. Peter is always saying something wrong, which I can really relate to. So here's a Mario. So he interrupts them. I think it's important. I think we should be thankful that many times Jesus interrupts us because we need to be interrupted. Because as we see, the disciples are thinking about the wrong total thing that Jesus is trying to uh, come across with. He interrupts them, and it's interesting the way what he says when he interrupts him. He says, you of little faith. What does that have to do with the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Why does he say that? Well, what he's saying is he reminds them of all the things that uh, recently, the two times that he fed the multitude. He takes a small amount of bread, small amount of fish, and he multiplies it enough to feed the thousands. So the disciples know this, right? They know about these miracles. They don't only really know about it. They experienced it. They were part of it. They saw it. So being there and seeing with their own eyes, would you not think that they would know Jesus wasn't concerned about food, nor should they be concerned? If you saw Jesus feed the 5,000, would you ever worry, is, God, is he going to be able to feed us as we're traveling around? It's like, man, he could multiply. He could take a little crumb and multiply it, so we're good. He says, because of your lack of faith. It's almost like you've got to see it over and over. He does a miraculous things, but yet it fades. Let's, let's continue on so we can understand it a little better. Verse 11, he says, How is it you don't understand that I was not talking about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So he, Jesus asked them another question. I think he was like prodding their minds and their hearts. And he's saying, how come you don't understand? What he's really saying is, you should know, have known what I was talking about. You know I can meet your physical needs, so why would I be worried about bread? How did you miss the spiritual meaning? So what Jesus does after saying that, he simply repeats the same question again, or statement. He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they get it. Why did they get it? He basically said, stop focusing on the physical needs. You know I can meet those. Focus on what I'm trying to teach you. It's kind of like when your boss tells you something, you think you're in trouble. And I've mentioned this many times. I really, I really dislike it if you know. They tell you at 9 o'clock in the morning, I need to meet with you. You guys ever have that happen? I think they do it on purpose. And they say, 3 o'clock, I need to meet with you, and it's 9. And all day I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? And in the afternoon, he simply says, here's what we're going to do this week. Here's our plan. In the same way, we focus on the wrong things. And Jesus says, don't focus on me reprimanding you. I'm not worried about you forgetting the bread. Focus on what I'm trying to teach you, the spiritual truth that is the most important question you can answer. They have themselves pulled back to the being taught mode, and they realize that Jesus is speaking metaphorically. He's using this example to teach them a spiritual truth. I love what David Guzik says about this. He says, leaven is consistently used as a picture of sin and corruption, especially in the Passover in Exodus 12, 8 and 12, 15 to 20. So it was a, a Jewish metaphorical expression for evil influence. So this is something that they've heard before. This metaphor has been used before. So they should have recognize it, but their mind was in the wrong place. You ever have your mind in the wrong place? You're so focused on what you did wrong or what went wrong, and you miss what God is trying to tell you. So we see that it's symbolic of not only uh, evil, but leaven was also symbolic of false doctrine or even false teaching. Jesus 
is impressing upon them the importance of being on guard against false teaching, especially in the service of a religious hypocrisy. What are you saying? Let me sum it up. He's saying, beware of legalism and religion. Do you think that's something that we need to be aware of today? It's rampant. It's, it's no different from the first genera- for the first century where, when the church began. Legalism and religion comes in. These two things almost go hand in hand. These two things don't draw us close to God. They usually drive people away. Draw or drive people away from God, away from the truth. That's what religion does. There's so many people without hope, without peace, joy, and they seek after the truth, and sometimes they run into religion. Instead of drawing closer to God, they find themselves even farther away from Him. They find themselves burdened with these things of doing to obtain forgiveness. When you focus on religion, religion causes you to seek after works in an effort. Now, we do works because we love Jesus. We love what He's done for us. But these guys, religion causes you to to do works in an effort to obtain forgiveness and salvation through God, through our own abilities. That's actually enticing to, to, the, to man because we want to be able to do, we want to have some control of our own destination, of our, our salvation. But when what religion also does, it makes what Jesus did on the cross not quite enough. Not enough to pay the full price of our sins. And that is totally not true because Jesus told us this before he died. He said these simple words, it is finished. You guys know what he meant by that? When he said it is finished, he's saying everything that needed to be done for your forgiveness, I've done it right here. You don't have to work. You don't, as a matter of fact, you cannot work to obtain it. I want to give you a, a sign of religion. You go different places. You want to know one thing that I use for, to show me that someone's talking, pushing me towards religion? Whenever they say, Jesus plus anything, it's religion. You need Jesus, but plus you need to knock on a thousand doors. You need to read this book. You need to read this magazine. You need to do this, this, or that. He says, it is finished. All you need to uh, repent of your sins, place your faith in Jesus Christ, accept Him as your Lord and Savior, it is finished. Now what happens after that is it Him sanctifying us, changing us. We are justified. You guys have heard the fancy big word, justification. I like to say it because I can actually say that word, justification. Just as if you had never sinned. That's what it means. Sanctification is changing us daily. As we live in the sinful body, changing us daily to be like Christ. If you guys, when you became a Christian, did you look in the mirror, mirror and say, man, I see Jesus. I'm like, man, you look messed up. You need help. But every day we should see our actions, we should see our character, all this changing, conforming to truly reflect Jesus' character day by day. But again, religion does not do that. Religion draws you to man. You know that? Religion draws you to man. Relationship draws you to God. Religion pushes you from God. Let's look at verse uh, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, Jesus and the disciples are always moving from place to place, but now we see him going up um, north from the Sea of Galilee, I think about 25 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee. Now, it's important to understand, historically, at that time, it was mainly non-Jewish. And again, he was reaching out to the Jews first, right? So I believe it in a sense he's getting away into a place where he doesn't have these crowds pressing upon him. Now, within the, the crowds are Gentiles, but mainly in that area were Jews. So he gets away so he can take that personal time to teach his disciples. And as he goes up there, he begins with asking them a question, who do people say I am? Who do they say the Son of Man is? So first we want to begin with, what does he mean by Son of Man? Have you guys heard that phrase over and over? The Son of Man. What does it mean or what does it represent? Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man 88 times in the New Testament. So it's important, right? There's two meanings of this. The first meaning of the phrase, Son of Man, is a reference to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. So I'm going to turn there. Daniel chapter 7. We're going to look at three verses. Daniel 7 verse 1 and verses 13 and 14. 
in verse 1. Unless I should let you guys get there, right? Daniel chapter 7. It's in the Old Testament somewhere in the middle. That doesn't help you, does it? Verse 1 says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. And visions passed through his mind as he was lying in his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dreams. Now we jump forward to verse 13. He goes, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Now listen to this description of the Son of Man. A man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancients of days, as we know, study scripture that's speaking of God. And he was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So we know without a doubt this speaks of the Messiah, the Son of Man. It speaks of his messianic title. Jesus would come back. Again, that's what the Jews were expecting when Jesus first returned, a, a, a Messiah that would come and deliver them from off underneath the oppression of the Roman Empire, and then he would restore the nation of Israel, God's kingdom then. But what it is speaking of, as it speaks of Jesus, the one who has given dominion and glory, he says, understand that Son of Man, a Son of God implies his deity, and the Son of Man implies his humanity. So it shows you that he's fully God and he's fully man. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand that. Basically, God humbled himself, Jesus, and put on flesh. Can you imagine being God and put on this flesh? He did that for us. So that, again, he won't be, Jesus is our high priest. He's our mediator between us and God. But see, he, he doesn't speak from inexperience. He's experienced the many things that we have and even more. You Think about the life of Jesus. Did he not suffer? Wasn't he tempted? He went through all these things. But yet, he came through it without sin. So he can relate to what we go through. It also speaks, again, of his humanity and of his deity. So I think it's very important for us to understand that Jesus is God. Who, is, who do they say I am? And we're going to see as we go on, because we, we don't give Jesus the, the respect and the honor that he deserves if we put him any less. Let's continue on. Now, Jesus asked the question, Why, who do people say I am? Do you think Jesus is like, man, what are they saying about me? You guys ever do that? What is that guy saying about me? You think Jesus was doing that? No, I think Jesus knew what the people thought about him. He was asking because he wanted to bring his disciples. Remember, he's teaching his disciples. He's, bringing, he's drawing them along with this question, bringing them to the most important question, which we'll see him ask here in a moment. Let's look at verse, verse 14. So he asked, who do people say I am? Now they're going to tell us what the people think. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter, love Simon Peter. He's he's like my twin brother except bigger. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So many people looked at the miracles of Jesus and they thought maybe he's John the Baptist back from the dead. Or maybe he's even Elijah returning as Malachi 4, 5 had prophesied that Elijah would come. And we know in the spirit of Elijah came in John, John the Baptist. Many thought maybe he's a prophet Jeremiah. So they're like, we know he's from God, he's a prophet, but we're not sure which one. Perhaps seeing Jesus in these roles, people hope for this political Messiah who would overthrow the corrupt powers oppressing Israel. So the, the general tendency to the, this, answer this question, who Jesus is, many underestimate Jesus. They fail to give him the measure of respect, the measure of honor, and they fall short of honoring him for who he really is. Who is Jesus? He is God. And if you think any less of him than that, it puts him in a place where he doesn't belong. He puts him alongside other prophets and other men of God. He's not a man of God. He is God. There's a big difference, isn't there? I like what Warren Worsby said about this. He says, We can never make a true decision about Jesus Christ by taking a poll of the people. But some people do get their spiritual knowledge this way. He says, The important thing is not what others say, 
But what do you and I personally say? The decision of the crowd, wrong or right, can never substitute for a personal decision. You see what he's saying? It's important. The decision about accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is one personal between you and God. No one else, no matter what the crowd says, that's not going to be affecting you in the sense of the decision is up to you. He says, who do you say I am? So he takes the first question, who do they say? Brings them to where he wants them to be. Who do you say that I am? Again, this is the reason and the purpose behind Jesus' first question. Again, it's fine for the disciples to know what others thought about Jesus, but Jesus had to ask them as individuals, what do you believe about me? Think about it. They've been traveling with him for about three years, close to three years now. What do you, what do you think? Do you, and I'm sure many of them thought he was a prophet at first as they began to experience and to come to know him. They realized that he was God. This question, who do you believe that I am, is a question that's placed before all who hear of Jesus. We are judged by our answer. And in fact, the, the way we answer this question, we, we see we actually answer this question every day. You know how we do that? By what we believe, by what we do. We answer this question, if we believe Jesus is God, it should be seen in the way we live. Think about that. If you truly believe Jesus is God, shouldn't that affect the way you live? All the things he tells us. Simon Peter answers this question. Again, he had some help. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So who is Jesus? He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So Peter answers it correctly, or you are the Messiah that we've been waiting for, that these religious leaders are supposed to be watching for. The title Messiah, as we translate it into um, English, is actually Christ, which is denotes the anointed one, or the consecrated one, or the one who is prepared for the redemptive work as a prophet, priest, and king of God's people. Now when I see this confession of Peter, hasn't Peter and some of the other apostles already recognized that Jesus was the Messiah? Let me give you some examples to remind you. In John chapter 1, do you remember when Jesus was calling the disciples and he, he, he was calling Nathaniel? He comes up to Nathaniel and he said, I saw you under the, the fig tree. And, and Nathaniel responds, truly, truly, you are the Son of God. Because he said, I saw you under the fig tree. And then in John chapter 6, after Jesus fed the 5,000, Peter declared. Here's what Peter said. Truly, you are the Son of God. You have the words of eternal life. So yes, they had, Jesus' disciples had acknowledged his deity previously. But we see in every case, their acknowledgement was an emotional response to a physical miracle. You saw me under the fig tree, so you must be the Son of God. Look at the fish, you must be the Son of God. Wow, 5,000 fed? You, I've never seen this before. You must be the Son of God. But there's a difference between those past statements and the statement by Peter here in Matthew 16. This is not an emotional response now. The response that he is giving is carefully thought through. It's a conclusion based upon a supernatural revelation. What does it mean? God revealed this to him. What this also is telling us, Jesus is not looking for an emotional response that fades as quickly as the excitement of miracle fades. I love these evangelical outreaches, but many that come down, it's an emotional thing. You love these Greg Laurie things? You guys ever see those? Those things are awesome, and many people get saved. But some are emotional things, and as soon as the emotion fades, so does the relationship. God wants from the heart to look at it. And again, Christians, we're not called to check our mind at the door. Have you heard that? Christians check their mind at the door. No, God gives plenty of evidence. Matter of fact, He calls us to use our mind even more, again, guided by the Holy Spirit, as He gives us His wisdom and guidance. God is looking for a man or a woman who will come to him in a rational, intellectual conclusion based on deep spiritual revelation. Here's what God is listening for. He's listening for those who say, I have concluded that you are the Christ, not because I won the lottery, not because I feel better physically, but because you have revealed yourself to my heart spiritually and to my mind rationally. You get that? 
It's not about an emotional thing because emotion fades, doesn't it? Emotion is like a roller coaster. You get on that one dumb, you're excited. The next time, not so much. And, you know, it's just not the way. It's not about a relationship. It's about yourself. Let's continue on and see how Jesus responds to Peter's answer. I would say he's as surprised as we are. Wow, Peter got the answer right. But he is God and he knew that it was going to be revealed to him. So verse 17 says, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. All right, you other disciples, don't get excited. It wasn't, you know, he didn't turn it into this really smart guy now. It's God who revealed this truth to you. And that's really saying God can reveal the truth to any one of us that are willing to listen to the truth. Now, here's where we're going to get into a couple next few verses. I'm going to briefly explain different points because people will take this next few sections and they'll twist it into their own purpose and their own use. He says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Again, Peter revealed this answer, confession, because it was revealed to him. This truth was revealed to him by God. Now, we look at Peter. There's two different Greek words here. One's for small rock, one's for big rock. Peter, you are a rock. But then Jesus added, on this rock, the big rock, I will build my church. Now, because of these different Greek words used, conservative scholars look at this and believe that Jesus is now building his church on himself. Others hold that the church is built upon Peter. I'm looking at Peter, and I'm thinking, the church is going to be built on Peter and the other apostles as the building foundation stones. Now, I want you to know, in Scripture, you can, that's why you've got to read uh, Scriptures in context of book, chapter, book, and the entire Bible. Because in Ephesians 2, chapter 20, they can draw that when it talks about building upon the foundations of the stones of the apostles. But there are other scholars that say the church is built upon Peter's testimony. Now, here's what I believe as I read all this, and I'll give you a verse to back that up. It seems best to understand that Jesus was praising Peter for his accurate statement. I personally would be like all over Peter. Man, you got it right. You know, you guys understand Peter from my perspective. He seems to always get it wrong. He's always speaking without thinking. It's like me. You know, I'll say something, and it's like, oh, I need to, you know, you can't take words back, right? Oh, that's Peter for you. I love him because it reminds me of myself. So he's praising him, but he's also introducing the work of building the church upon himself, Jesus Christ. And why do I say that? Jesus is the foundation of the church. I'm just going to read this to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, Paul says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Isn't that not clear? The church is built upon Jesus Christ, and then he passes on, teaches it to the disciples, apostles, as they continue to pass on to us. What I see here, it talks about the keys of the kingdom of heaven are given to Peter. I see these keys as none other than the gospel message. How do you get into heaven? You hear the gospel message, the keys that opens or closes the door, either closes or locks it. It is through the, the message the Holy Spirit works. We have been blessed. Do you guys know we're blessed just to be able to take the gospel message out? Just so you know, we're not the best people to do that. We're always complaining. We're always making excuses, right? But God has blessed us by allowing us to be a, the small part of what He's doing. So we take the message out. We repeat it. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does the work. So this should be encouraging to you guys as believers. As you take it out... You're not being rejected. It is God who's being rejected. And it's not your job. Don't you get frustrated? I told you, you didn't. And they accept Christ. What's well, not your job? Do awesome. But if not, remember, His word does not come back void. The Holy Spirit convicts their heart and brings that person to a, a point where He can receive or reject. He rep repent of His sins. He can either repent and receive God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So it, He's the one that brings them that, to that point. Now, I understand when people say, have you saved anyone? I say, I've never saved anyone in my life spiritually. Have you taken the gospel message? I can say, yes, I've taken the good news. 
is the Holy Spirit that saves. So that takes some burden off you. You guys don't have to save anybody. You know, we're like superheroes. We're going to not save. No, you're just the superhero's messenger. You take the message and allow God to do the work. Now here's another part of this scripture that gets kind of twisted. The binding and loosing. Have you guys heard of that? Whatever you bind here is bound in heaven. So man, you guys are powerful. If the keys of the kingdom of heaven is the gospel message, then it would make sense to me that those who accept Jesus Christ are loosed or freed from the bondage of sin. Those who refuse Christ remain bound in their sin. Those who are loose or bound here in heaven, same thing. So these keys can be used to also free someone, but they also can be used to lock the door as well. So part of the gospel message as we take it is it takes faith is needed for them to believe. Without faith in Christ, the door in heaven is shut and barred. So as the apostles preached the gospel, those who respond in faith and repentance were granted access to the kingdom of heaven. Yet those who continue to harden their hearts and reject the gospel of God's saving grace are shut out of the kingdom. So you guys get the picture of binding and loosening. You're bound to your sin or you're loose from that. I see that. I, the other one is, is almost like you give, you know, they speak of Peter being the first pope and he has all this power to forgive and uh, forgive sins. Only God has the power to forgive sins. You know that, right? No one ever has had the power. Not even the Hebrew Israel, the, the Israelites. You know, I see it similarly in, in what they do is the priesthood in the Old Testament before Jesus came, man would have to go to the priest and he would go before God. But when Jesus came, he became our high priest, so there is no need. And matter of fact, it becomes religion if you continue to do that. But even in that time, the priest did not forgive their sins. They brought those sins and um, sacrifice before God, and he's the one that forgave it. Man has no power to forgive anyone of their sins, only God. Can I have the worship team please come up? As we conclude, we're gonna, I'm going to um, give you a couple points, and we're going to get ready to go into communion. But I want to ask you a, a, a few things first. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you know that Jesus tells us over and over who he is? And here's the one that I really love. John chapter 14, verse 6, where he says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except to me. So the Father's in heaven. No one gets into heaven to the Father except through Jesus Christ. That kind of negates any other religion. You can't go through any man, any person, any religion. God, Jesus tells us, I'm the only way. So what I'm saying is, forget about trying religions and see if it works. This is not about a religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he makes it clear, I'm the only way. One more illustration, one more verse that really speaks clearly to this. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they died. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you guys believe this? If you believe this, then you, he's your Lord and Savior. But what about you guys here that don't believe this? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let today be that day that you say, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Forgive me my sins. You can do that right where you are. I, I encourage you to do that right where you are. And I also discourage you of partaking of communion unless you've accepted Jesus Christ. You know why I say that? That's messed up. Well, let me just tell you why. Because communion is reflecting on remembering what he's done for you. When you, you have to accept what he's done for you before it actually affects and changes your life. So I want you guys to be part of that. Not only that, but to be able to enter into God's kingdom. He's giving you the keys. You have the keys. You've heard the gospel message, right? He's the way, the truth, the life. Ask him into your life, and you can enter into heaven. But I'm not going to let believers off. You're like, all right, we always hammer the non-believers. How about us as believers? Just like the disciples, Jesus is teaching us as we walk along with him in this life, as he walks along with us. The way we live says what we believe. The way we live says volumes. We can say from our mouth many things that are not true. I'm awesome. But you guys watch me and think, you're not that awesome. But if I live an awesome life, you guys can say yes. I don't even have to say it. You'll see it. 
But if we live as a Christian, we don't have to say, hey, by the way, I'm a Christian. I don't know if you know this or I forgot to tell you. You shouldn't have to tell them. They should be able to see the way you live. And then they say, there's something different about you. And you know when they see that, that opens the door for the keys to be handed over to them, the gospel message. Oh, you want to know what's different? Here's what changed me, and it can change you. So remember, you have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You have the gospel message. You have the good news that Jesus died for your sins, for our sins. So I encourage you, share the good news, not just through your words, but through your actions. So we're going to take this few moments, and what we do with communion you're supposed to go into communion, and if there's any unforgiven sin, a repentant of sin, do it now. But why we're just going to take this few moments, ask, and I say it like specifically this way, ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart. Because I used to say, examine your heart, but you know what? When I examine my heart, I don't look at the things that I push down that I don't want to see. Ask Him to look for the things that you're hiding. And when He reveals those things, ask for Him to deal with them. So with that, let's take a few moments as we prepare for communion.
think it's so important again to ask the question, who do you say I am? Again, when we get done with communion, if you need prayer as a believer, or maybe you want to accept Christ, we'll have counselors up here to pray with you. But the more we do communion, we do it once a month, and I don't want it to be religious. And you know, anything can become religious, even though God instituted it. Jesus gave this to us for a reason. Do you know why Jesus gave this to us? Because he knows us. He knows that we'll get so busy with life, with family, with kids, with whatever, and we'll forget about what he's done for us. So communion makes us stop, examine our hearts, which we need to do. As I was just saying, having the Holy Spirit look deep in there. And it also causes us to look back and be reminded of, first of all, his great love. Because of his great love, he gave this great sacrifice, his life. You guys remember how Jesus took upon himself our sins so that we could once again be in fellowship. And that's one thing I like to remind us. You know, it's, it doesn't end there at forgiveness. The whole purpose of forgiveness is relationship. God wants you to know him like he knows you. You know, God knows everything about us. So we might as well learn more about him, right? We learn more about him, we experience more of him. You guys want to experience more of God's love? Yeah? We need to seek to experience more of him. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You guys see the full picture here? past, present, and future, looking back, remembering, reflecting on what he's doing now, and says, do this in remembrance, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're here presently proclaiming that he has died and he's resurrected. Not only that, we're looking to the future. Is our future bright? It's amazingly bright. We're looking for it and expecting Jesus to return at any moment. Biblically, prophetically, what else needs to be done? Nothing that I know of, Jesus could arrive at any moment. Let's stand as we end with a word of prayer. Again, if anyone needs any prayer, we're going to have Pastor Lester up here, Sandra, Tim. I'll be around also. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Again, I pray, Lord, as, as we've heard your message, we've heard your words as you speak to each and every one of us individually, and you also speak to us as a church. I pray, Lord, that we leave here, and we don't just leave here hearing your word, but we leave here seeking to apply it. And we know the only way we can apply your word is by asking you, the Holy Spirit, to apply it in our lives, because we have neither the, the wisdom, the understanding, or the ability. Only you can change us to be like your son. So I pray, Lord, just change all of us with the words you've spoken today. And again, encourage us to, to go back and seek you and read your word to draw closer to you. Again, you said, as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. I pray, Lord, for everyone here that they would experience more and more of your love every day. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. You guys have a blessed week, and I hope I'll see you guys on Wednesday.